Hi, friends, and welcome to the second session in this series, Embracing Spiritual Awakening. Um, I just want to uh, note uh, that you are have probably in front of you your participant handbooks. And one of the features uh, of this series is that there's actually no identified leader guide. You all have the guide. And it's the same for uh, you as participant or if you happen to be sharing in the facilitation of the process in your own group, it's the same. We, we've just decided to give everybody everything and, um, and let you figure out how to share the leadership. So I hope that's going to go well for you. Uh, you've had one session, and now here you are in the second session uh, trying out that uh, style of shared leadership. The other thing I want you to notice is that at the beginning, you're coming to this session, and perhaps you've had a chance to look at the five ways that we suggest that you anticipate or get into this session ahead of time so that you may have spent some time with those five uh, ways of entering into this theme uh, before being with the group today. So that's another feature of this, and I'll make reference to other ones as we go. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is the encouragement to keep attending to the life of your learning community. I just think it's really important that... Uh, as, as engaging as this theme is, that we don't, act, we don't lose sight of the fact that we're actually living what we're talking about in these small groups. That's what we're doing here and you folks there. So keep watching the life of your community and sharing the responsibility for maintaining that. So we are here in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, getting to know one another here in the second uh, Session. We're spending two days in this filming process, and um, actually, I'm, uh, my sense is that we're loving being with one another already, that this is a really nice group, and I'm just delighted that we have this time, and I hope that's true for you too. We're also getting to meet Diana Butler Bass, um, whose uh, name has become prominent in this whole area of um, emergent uh, Christianity, and as you heard in the last session, in the first session, emergent spiritual and religious realities in our own context today. Diana, as you've already seen, is an energized and visionary person. Uh, it's great to be, actually be with her. Uh, I'm sure that some of that is coming across to you. In this session, Diana is, bringing, is going to introduce to us the three Bs. Uh, and you're going to find that material in your study guide, and with an emphasis on believing. So, Diana, let's continue to explore the dynamics of faith. Thank you, Tim. Um, one of the things that I think is sort of interesting when you start talking about this language of awakening, especially using the word spiritual and awakening together, is that a lot of people will immediately think, ooh, you know, it's so spooky. Um, and there's a sort of part of my personality that is, as I confess to you all before, um, sort of mystical. And I'm very comfortable with the ideas of spirituality and the whole Christian mystical tradition. But there's this other part of me that is an academic. You know, I have a PhD in religious studies from Duke University. And so if we think about uh, being religious and spiritual or spiritual and religious, putting the things together... Uh, when it comes to how I approach doing analysis of culture, um, I'm both an academic and a participant. I am scientific, and I give a lot of room for the Holy Spirit. So I actually am trying to model uh, out of the heart of who I am um, what I'm talking about. And so this part of our exploration uh, definitely models Diana, um, the academic. <laughs> so I'm just giving you sort of a, a warning on that. And um, I don't want people to think that making a spiritual awakening or participating in a spiritual awakening is just kind of vague or fuzzy. But there are specific, there's a specific sort of shape um, that is emerging, that the shape that Christianity is going to be taking in the 20th, 21st century I think is already with us, and we can really begin to see its contours. And that's what happens in all the previous awakenings in American history. 
um, is that at every one of the historical times when there has been what we call a great awakening, Christianity um, and sort of more broadly faith life in the United States um, is reshaped. That is, people engage in new patterns, that new theological emphases come to the fore. And uh, what our ancestors practiced as faith is not really quite the same as we practice faith. So, so part of my job as a historian of Christianity is to remind people that the tradition of Christianity is that the tradition always changes. And uh, in every time of awakening, the tradition changes very rapidly and very dramatically. And I think that's one of the places we are right now, is that Christianity itself is being reshaped uh, by these cultural changes and also by new sorts of internal questions uh, that are arising. So I like to help people understand this uh, so that part of it is we're not afraid of what's coming. Um, And the way that I have been approaching it for the last couple years is to do something that's very basic in the study of religion. Uh, Now, here I'm not talking about religion as organized religion or the way it's popularly used, as we talked about in the last program. But here I'm talking about it. I'm going to give you a definition of religious studies or or religion as used in religious studies classes uh, to sort of frame this program and the next two. Um, sometimes when I'm, uh, I'm in conversation with someone in the world and they ask me what I do, and I'll, I'll say I have a, a PhD in religious studies, people will say, is that a real thing? You know, <laughs> And I'll say, yes, you can really get a PhD in religious studies. And they'll say, well, exactly how do you do that? Do you, do you pray a lot and then you get graded on it? Or, and, and I say, no, no, it's actually science. Um, and what we do is we look at, and I've, I've given, uh, given all of you a handout here, we look at uh, these three things that are on uh, the page. Uh, we study what people believe, what, they, what their understandings are of God and the world, the universe, cosmology, all these different kinds of things. Uh, We study how people act, uh, what their behaviors are um, related to those beliefs. And acting includes uh, stuff like worship or uh, life rituals, um, baptism and uh, growing up rituals, uh, wedding rituals, um, how people end you know, funeral rituals, things like that. Um, and then finally, the third area is how, pe- how these two things, how believing a particular way and how a particular set of ritual acts uh, gives human beings a sense of belonging to one another or to a particular sort of tribe. And so um, in religious studies classes, uh, this would be uh, an outline for a first semester class in in religious studies, uh, where the teacher would uh, basically go through each one of these areas, and then you would usually explore a group of different religions and try to analyze them using this process. So you would look at something like a Seneca Indian tribe from the 18th century in upstate New York or uh, in Ontario. And then you could look at uh, 16th century Protestantism or 5th century uh, Roman Catholicism, or you can look at today. And uh, so you take whatever group you're exploring, whatever their religious tradition is, and you begin to analyze all three of these things. And so when you talk about religious studies, um, that's what we're talking about, how human beings uh, believe, how they behave in relationship to those beliefs and what that does for their sense of identity, where they belong. And so when I was thinking about spiritual awakening, I, I realized that, um, you know, having this background, I realized that there are sort of conventional ways that we've understood uh, believing, behaving, and belonging. Um, those of us who have been part of church communities perhaps in our whole lives or just sort of have grown up in a culture that was a bit, bit more church than it is, 
um, is that there's this sort of conventional pattern of these three things. And then there's this pattern, the shifting pattern. There's, there's something new that is occurring. So instead of just saying, oh, we're moving into a sort of emergent future and everything is changing, which basically scares the bejesus out of most people, <laughs> what, what I actually think is happening is that we are not just going to a place where everything is going to be new. Human beings in the 21st century, whether they're Christians or Muslims or Buddhists or whatever their, their faith tradition is, human beings in the 21st century are still going to believe, they're still going to behave in interesting ways related to those beliefs, and we are still going to have senses of belonging that are related to these other two. So we're not leaving that behind. Um, that whole human enterprise of these three Bs is moving with us um, into the future. What is changing is what the questions are under each category. And so um, these three sections of the discussion are going to be about how, what the questions used to be and what the questions are in the process of becoming and how that might reshape what we think about our own faith lives and our, our communities that we're passionate about. So the first one uh, to explore is uh, the question of believing or under, understanding. And I, I gave a sample question on this slide, uh, which is a simple kind of question. Do you believe God exists? And so you kind of get what this question is going towards, uh, conceptualizations of, of faith. And so if you go to the second page, the one that says conventional religious questions, you'll see here that uh, I've listed believing. And the question that believing has been uh, for a very long time in Western culture when we think about belief, uh, since about, oh, I don't know, probably 200 or maybe even 300 years, in Western Christendom, uh, the question has been, what do I believe or what do you believe or what do we believe? And the expectation when you ask the question, what, is that you'll get some information uh, that tells your, your neighbor uh, what you think about God or what you think about the church or the sacraments or how the church should be arranged or whether or not there's infant baptism. And so we say, well, I believe that or we believe that. So we're giving people information. Um, the what question about belief is a very powerful question. And it is one that was necessitated uh, by historical events a few hundred years ago. Uh, if you think about when you're in late medieval Europe and the Reformation happens, you had a Catholic church, and then all of a sudden this huge historical rift, and there's not just one church in Western Europe anymore, but now there are five before the Reformation, the what do Christian, Christians believe question for a long time wasn't very significant because it was sort of just assumed uh, throughout Europe that everybody was Christian, that everybody was Catholic, and everybody sort of believed the same thing. And so the what question wasn't terribly important. But when you have five religious traditions after about 1600 contending for the loyalty of people, they have to be very clear about what they believe. And so Christians went really to school <laughs> in this great enterprise uh, for a couple hundred years of organizing their belief systems so that it was very clear what Lutherans believed, what Anglicans believed, what Mennonites believed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we organized all those answers into things that we refer to as creeds and doctrine, and sometimes you hear people use the word dogma. And so if anybody ever has asked you the question, what do you believe, 
Um, it's actually a very simple question to answer. You can tell them to look it up on the internet. <laughs> you can hand them a, 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 usually those one, a creed is essentially a one page summary of what you believe. You can hand them that one page summary in the form of a creed or, you know, nearly every denomination has a book that's entitled something like What Presbyterians Believe or What Lutherans Believe. So you can send them to your pastor and you can say, pastor can tell you, you know. Or, uh, so, so that's the, the what question. And we are very used to that question. Um, I'd really be interested in, in, in how you respond to this because... A few years ago, I realized that despite the fact that believing is about what, hardly anybody in my life has ever asked me the question, what do Christians believe? Or what do I believe? Um, The only people who have ever really seriously engaged me on a question about sort of doctrinal information about what Christians believe are some Muslim friends um, occasionally Jewish friends, but not even really that much. Yeah, Jews in America and I think in Canada mostly assume that they know what Christians think because they're around so many Christians. Um, and and um, that's really about it. Uh, so when I think about the what question, it's almost kind of an empty space in my life. People just don't ask me that question. People assume that they know what I think when they hear that I'm a Christian. And so this is the way that I think the question has changed, and, and this would be on the third, the third sheet that you have, is that I think that we've moved from the conventional question towards an experiential question. I list it as, I call it a spiritual question on this particular handout, because it's about how we experience belief. People will ask me the question, and sometimes multiple times in a single day, um, how do you believe that? Um, I'll be in a line at Starbucks and just sort of randomly in a conversation with uh, with a, a complete stranger about something related to religion. And they'll say to me, oh, gosh, oh, you're a Christian. Well, I would be a Christian, but I just don't know how to believe that believe in Jesus. Or um, when I've talked to people about potentially becoming churchgoers, uh, you know, I say, well, I go to this church and it's a nice place and we have good community. They'll say, well, I would sort of like to go to church, but I don't know how I could ever recite the creed. How do you do that? I just don't believe that. I just don't believe in that. Uh, And then there's the classic uh, it comes up once in a while, even around the dining room table with my own uh, child, is like, well, I don't know, really know how to be a Christian and, be a, and, and to believe in science at the same time. Um, or how in the world do you believe in this virgin birth thing and still seem like you're a really rational, intelligent, functioning human being in the 21st century? And so if we pay attention to our lives, it, it really sort of strikes me that this becomes the question, is that people are not nearly as concerned about what we believe anymore, but people are asking us for how we believe it. And ultimately, um, this how question is people are requesting from us to tell our experience of being a Christian person and how we put these pieces together in our lives and in our, in our theological and philosophical kinds of worldviews. You know, how does this make sense to you? They're asking us for how it has meaning to us. And so this is a much harder thing to do. Um, back in the conventional sort of world, if somebody asked us what we believe, they weren't asking us personally uh, really anything. They were simply asking us for information. And we could hand them a piece of paper that was fairly objective, or we could tell them to talk to our priest or minister. And we weren't necessarily having to invest our own selves in the answer. Oh, this is what Christians believe. We believe in God, Father Almighty, etc. 
But now people are saying, how do you do it? How do you make sense of this story that you claim marks your life, your life, this story about Jesus? And how does that story connect to your life in the world? How do you think about science? How do you think about politics? How do you think about moral life? How do you engage it? And so people are asking us now not just for our ideas about God, but instead are asking us to, in a very real sense, give us their, our story, give them their, our story about the convictions that frame our lives. And that can be very intimidating uh, for people to engage in. Uh, but it is a huge switch And I think that this is the new question. The how question has become the primary question of belief in our time. Diana, thank you. That was uh, very rich. And I just felt myself being drawn in a whole lot of directions. Uh, And I'm really curious now to see uh, what uh, our other six uh, friends in the circle of learning might have to uh, bring to the conversation. So who would like to begin this time? Uh, let me just jump in, because I'm just thinking about this, and I was really with you right up until you got to the how, and that's when it became, became kind of scary to me, because it was really easy to point to the creeds and everything and say, this is what we believe. But when I was faced with answering that question, how, after my wife passed away and my mm-hmm. kids said, Dad, how can you go to church? How can you pray? And how, where was God in this? And, and I have to admit, I had never come to grips with an answer that I felt was satisfactory with that. So I, I, I think that first part of saying, oh, here they are at the Nicene Creed, oh, that's all good. But it's that how that, that gets into my gut and bothers me because I'm not sure I have an answer. And I don't know what to say. Do other people feel that same way? Well, I, I have a similar um, um, experience because I grew up in a very evangelical conservative church. And we were always taught at, a, at an early age to witness to people and that you, ex, you expressed your beliefs to people in general and to help bring them um, closer to God and Jesus. Um, and then when I joined the Episcopal Church... We had someone stop by the house who was on a mission trip from one of those uh, evangelical churches and asked me what I believed. And my first thought was, okay, well, here's what I believe, and I started with the creed. And when she, when I got to the part of, of Jesus, she's like, you actually believe in Jesus? And I'm like, well, yes. But that made me start thinking again of the, of the, the how and that it's a very personal thing. And I think because I had that tradition at a young age um, of, of witnessing and, and talking about my faith, I felt a little more comfortable. And maybe it's that in a more reserved um, traditional um, denomination that we haven't been taught how to express our witness and express our beliefs of how we believe. Mm-hmm. There was a very powerful how question that arose just recently um, after those children were shot at the school in Newtown, Connecticut. I was on the phone with uh, my best friend who happens to be an atheist. And um, we were talking about the spiritual, uh, the, the memorial service that was held right afterwards that was televised that President Obama uh, spoke at. And uh, she I, I could literally hear her almost over the phone shaking her head, and she said, see, it's, it's things like this that I don't know how it is that you can be a Christian. You know, this, may, this kind of evil and the answers that I'm hearing from religious people in the world, she says, this makes no sense to me. How does your faith account for the murder of these children? And I was actually, I mean, I'm pretty... I, I, I feel like I'm pretty able to deal with how questions. I'm pretty in, intentional about thinking in this way. 
And when she said that, I was literally silenced. A little like you were saying, or, you know, I didn't know what to say. And because she asked it um, in such a kind of forceful way, I, I just confessed to her. I said, you know, I don't know how. And I have to say that I'm pretty upset by this. And, she said, and then she said to me, you know what, in this very real sense, that's all I want to hear you say. She said, I don't want to hear the easy answer coming from Christians on this one. She said, I want to hear you say, you don't know how. And, and I thought, well, there's a moment. You know, she led me to a place to understand um, my own doubt, which is part of our spiritual lives, my own doubt a lot more. And so, so I think that that moment when we don't know what to say, it is actually the moment in which we have encountered the how question in a really deep sense. And that's, that becomes holy ground, to, uh, in, in a sense, I think, um, for being with people and for looking at what is it going to mean to be Christian in the 21st century and be increasingly encountered by these how questions. And the how changes. It changes with, as my mom says, just living. And it changes with your experiences. And it changes with time. And I can think of two times where I thought I knew the how. It was the how I was living. And then something so, I thought, um, impossible happened. One was my husband died. And... I had gone through all of the stages of adjusting, one to his illness and then to his dying and thinking, okay, so I'm living in a place where I never thought I would be, living like I thought I would never live, and experiencing growth of the how in ways that I didn't think it could grow. And then I sort of became comfortable with that how. And then all of a sudden, I found that my kidney was dead, and now I was going to be a transplant. I was going to be a, a kidney dialysis patient for as long as that would last, which could be three or four years. So now it's the how to gracefully prepare that you might be dying. And then I thought a lot of the restraints that I had on my life, I didn't need to put them there anymore because I wouldn't really be here that long. So you don't have to save for 20 years. You're not going to be here 20 years. Mm -hmm. So many things that I thought, this is how I have to behave. No, I really don't. I can, it freed me to feel ways that I didn't think I could feel. And then I got a transplant. So now I had to pull back, well, well now, wait a minute. You are going to be here for 20 years. You do need to save. You do need to be nice to people because they're, <laughs> they're going to be here longer than three years. <laughs> So the how developed a growth that I didn't think I would have to face. Yeah. And, and then it goes back to what my mom says, just keep living. And what you don't understand, you may develop a way to understand it, or you may learn to live with, so I don't have to know everything and understand everything. Put it in the hands of God, he knows That's a beautiful testimony to the, the very thing that I try to explain um, in the book that I wrote and when I'm doing this kind of work on the road. Uh, that is an experiential, you're explaining the experience of belief. And that's, that's really what I'm talking about here. It's what does it mean to experience belief, not just be able to have a piece of paper uh, where you can give the same answer over and over and over again. And that's essentially what, you know, when we think about formalized creed or doctrine, there's a very real way in which uh, people in the sort of larger cultural complex, when we say, oh, you know, I believe in Jesus, they think of it as just kind of this flat kind of statement, a creedal statement or whatever. Uh, but if we can begin to explain how in terms of our stories and how, how our belief changes over time um, and that becomes a much different engagement with people. It's not just handing them a piece of paper saying, this is what Christians are supposed to believe, but this is how I have experienced belief um, 
over my life. That's, that's thank you so much. That is an amazing story. One of the things that Alex's response reminded me of as well is the the word believe itself. Um, that word, it's a very strange word in English. Um, when we look at the New Testament, the the word for believe in Greek uh, was the word pistis or pistuo, uh, which means to trust or to faith. And there's there's really no verb in English which means to faith. And so when the original language was being translated from Greek into English in the 16th and 17th century, translators really struggled with how to take this Greek pistuo, meaning to faith, um, and put it in English. And they fell across this word, believe, uh, which in their context did not mean to have ideas or opinions about something. Um, The word believe in the original translation context meant um, to essentially (coughs) belove, to to be devoted to something or to trust something. And so the word believe actually holds within its roots um, this very experiential uh, kind of dimension of the how. Um, that believe isn't simply about signing your name to a dotted line about a group of ideas or having opinions about God, but it's literally about our disposition toward that God. So in a very real way, the creed could be better rendered, um, I beloved God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I beloved Jesus Christ, God's Son. I beloved the Holy Spirit. And that, um, I, I kind of always wish that the um, Episcopal Church Liturgical Commission would take my, uh, <laughs> my suggestion here and, and give us a better translation. You don't have to change anything else in the creed, but can you imagine if we just switched those couple letters there in the word believe, and we switched it to beloved, how that would change what happened in worship. Um, wow. I mean, that to me just explodes my heart to think that that, to move towards that more experiential place about the loving of God or the trusting of God. Yeah, I was sitting here when I was hearing everybody's stories and thinking when you talked about that question, I wasn't really thinking about events in my life. I was thinking about intentional spiritual practices that I do. And that's how I believe and it's, it's shaped me. I'm kind of like a spiritual uh, junkie, <laughs> spiritual practices junkie. <laughs> I try like lots of different things, and I love them, I, from icon work to uh, just meditation to different types of prayer and reading scripture and prayer. And, and that really shows me how to believe. It, it forms me and shapes me and, and informs me in many different ways. And it's become um, quiet time that that I cherish very much. That's a lovely place to take us to, Sharon. Um, I've been thinking about you know, what is the key to this kind of um, way of being. And the, the thing that I, had, oh, I was thinking about was the practice of being present. Mm-hmm. Like it really calls on us to be present to one another in very particular ways, if we're going to uh, live this kind of believe and beloving of one another, beloving of the journey. So what, is the, what are the practices? And I think, Diana, we may be moving on in the next session to some consideration of practice. Um, but it, it's kind of there, and I'm interested to pursue that further. But for now, this is wonderful. Thank you for responding. Thank you, Diana for moving us in this way. And folks, I can only imagine the kind of conversations, exploration that you would uh, now have, and I hope it's every bit as rich as the one that we're having here in Alexandria on this sunny day in March 2013. Over to you folks.